Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to the latest chapter of Oz Magica, taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links are down below, and please like, comment, and subscribe like any good minion of the algorithm would do. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. I'd quickly like to thank the following Tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you very much. Chapter 21 System Interlude by Naron A Beginner's Guide to Powers Granted by Local Ordinance to Patrov in his 80th year I didn't even know why I was writing this. Honestly, I can't even begin to comprehend why a noble child would need a book about this kind of thing. Of all things. But then again, I'm not paid to ponder the thoughts of a child. I've been paid to write a lesson on the introductory concept simply because the child is too scared of other people. Honestly, I'd be amazed if he could even read this, considering he's reportedly only two years old. So, I guess I might as well be writing this for the future version of that kid. So, hi. Your old man decided that I should probably tutor you, me being a local teacher and all. But when I first saw you in person, you decided to scream and run away from me. I mean, I can understand why someone might do that, as my form is pretty scary to someone that young. Man, it still hurts my feelings, though. If you can find it in yourself to not think about my appearance while reading this, it would probably help. Well, you probably don't remember, do you? I guess I should probably describe myself. Not too many of my kind in Eldemir. I have a cobalt. That basically means I look lizard-like and have an innate ability to control the natural forces. To be sure, I'm probably a bit more experienced in the lightning aspect than most of my kind, excluding the war majors. I have a mouth that juts out my face and eyes that are slitted. I have a somewhat locked tail. My scales are a particular shade of brown, though I forget the particular name for it. My hands are more like claws, so you can understand how difficult it is to write anything down about without... <clears throat> Sorry, uh, the core broke again. Uh, made an ink splotch a little, um... Anyways, you'll probably find more of that in my future writings. After all, I'm supposed to be a personal tutor. I guess that's as much as I can say. As your father is currently standing over my shoulder. Yes, I can see you, sire. I'll get to the descriptions now. For someone like us, basically mortals, there are three ways to get natural powers. Now, I won't be talking about some of the more complicated bits until much later. So, for now, I'll just focus on the natural strengths. Of these, I'll try and teach you a bit of them later on. Be sure to note that there will be other tutors that will likely be more specialized in those particular fields, and I'm not good at. Now, on to the main purpose of this little literary work. Powers. As I was saying, well, I guess the better word for it would be writing. Before, there are three main ways for a mortal to achieve power. Of these, two are more widely known and probably easier to do than the third. The first is probably the easiest way to achieve power. Before I go in depth about this, I must first state that I would not want you to pursue this path to achieve power. Most who delve into this type often have to break the thought container for it to properly function, the consequences of which are usually death if they are not able to control the first burst of energy. I understand that for those at your age, you probably put those majors on a pillar, but you must remember not to head down that path. I am told that this is because your older sister is already making a hallmark in it, also, breaking your mind is simply not advisable under the circumstances. You are, after all, the first son of your father has ever had. The second way is to second easiest and also the way that I will be trying to teach you. That of the way of the body. The body is essentially an instrument for one's will. If you push yourself in the right ways and have the right amount of energy to perform those actions, you can harness that energy to bless your body with specific qualities. Some of those are simple in mind and concept. For example, one could harness their energy to make oneself able to endure scorching heats or become resistant to blades. What I aim to teach you is something more complex, 
that being putting a touch of affinity into your body without suffering the consequences that getting one would get you. For example, I've managed to put lightning into my bones. I'm now the fastest in my family, even better than my wound affinity brother. This has also enabled me to inflict paralysis, albeit only for a short time, upon those who touch me without consent. Once you get over your fear of me, I will be much rather try and show you this in person and walk you through the steps. Your father has expressed some concern that I haven't talked about the third way to earn power. I honestly don't know what he expects me to say about it. I've only had a passing occurrences with monks, but I guess I should probably try and give you some introduction to the ideas of one who may be your future tutor. If you couldn't tell already, the three paths to attain power lie in the three main aspects of what makes a person. For magic, one must free and control the energies of the mind. For enhancement, one must connect and control the energies of the body. So, what's the last thing missing? Why am I writing a question in a book? I'll just state the answer plainly. It's the soul. You must understand that I personally do not know what messing around with the affairs of the soul actually do. I haven't had much experience with it, other than seeing others use it to perform actions that I thought weren't possible. Ending a fight without a spell nor a weapon, having the world around you perform to your whims and not forcing yours upon it at all. Things like that. Anyways, I hope this helped at least get a grasp as to what you're going to have to deal with in the future. Besides politics, economy, and such. Basically, noble things, since this is basically the introduction for the absolute basics. In the future, there will be more chapters containing how the powers relate to gods. The first occurrences of powers in history, the habits that might form from others that dabble in them, as well as more detail on how each power works. Keep in mind that these installments will be written every other day. So once you're able to read... I just want to say I'm sorry for the impeding coursework that you'll have to deal with. I hope this helped just at least a little bit more before we head more in depth into the history. Well, uh, it looks to me like he's a fine mess. His eyes gained a bit of clarity as he looked over at the plains. The monster seemed to be a green in its entirety, which meant that it was either one of three things. It was meant to camouflage amongst the grasses, it had some element of poison in it, or it was made up of plants. To Marvel, it was more than likely the first or the second and the third. Plant monsters were a rare thing to begin with, after all. Having one appear out here seemed almost like an impossibility. Marwal had debated whether or not it was worth trying and running away. He figured that running away is, almost always, the most appropriate action to take. In this case, though, there were a few problems regarding that. First was that the Alplekas was almost the slowest drive one could ask for. Sure, it was one of the better haulers due to the muscles it had, but it was undeniably slow. If he wanted to get away with his life, he'd have to run on paw. However, that came with its own set of problems. Wawa wasn't that strong. He could, at most, only carry one or two bags of his goods out of the 35 that he had. He would lose much of his income if he left the carriage behind. It also came with the fact that his legs weren't exactly made to carry anything heavy in the first place. His best bet, to him at least, was just to grab a pack and abandon all the hard-earned cash and goods. That was the only way that he could run away and still keep his life. Since that was an unacceptable outcome, he'd have to stay and fight. However, that was something that he hadn't really done before. Sure, there were mock battles that he was a part of before he became a merchant, but even then he didn't see the need to train his strength or his speed. The only thing that he could possibly use was his teachings. So with the doubt of creeping up in his mind and his body shivering, he brought in mind all he had learned in his 35 years. His body gained the strength of Stull, and his claws became serrated, and his eyes became slits, gaining the attributes of earth and darkness. It was not an easy task, however. Trying to maintain balance between the two differing attributes was a difficult task. One attribute was all that most could easily handle, and controlling two attributes took focus beyond the attention of most people. Thankfully, 
Enhancement also had that dual effect, in this case at least, to get rid of the alcohol that was in Marvel's body. Now he could see and judge quite clearly, and he was happy to say that he wasn't being paranoid. However, even the small glint of happiness did nothing for what was ahead. His enhanced perception and clear mind now filled in some of the other blanks. The creature ahead was a monster, and it was green, as he had originally perceived. However, his original assumption was now proven incorrect. It was indeed a plant monster. He noted the lithe bull as well. Whatever it was, while it had bulk, its haunched back and four legs easily gave evidence what the thing was made for. Speed. It was meant to overtake any escaping prey and maul it to death. What troubled Marwell, though, wasn't the creature's frame, but his lack of knowledge. He had never met or had known anyone who'd met a blonde monster, of course. The only thing he was certain of was that there was no vian domain around here, so the monster couldn't have been made there. It might have come from a ranks in the Caldara that was nearby, but he was more known for flesh monsters than anything. It could be an escape from Daryl's domain, but that was a couple of towns away. If it was able to get this far and nobody had sent anything by mail, then either this thing was something that had been able to sneak all the way into the interior of the kingdom, or Morank was finally taking a personal approach to plant-type monsters. However, his analysis of the beast was cut short when it suddenly vaulted towards him. Sure, it was still a few herent away, but it was able to cross several of them within one second. If he didn't do anything now, he'd most likely die a painful and horrific death. Well, it was either that or the monster feasted on some other emotion besides pain. But in Marl's opinion, it was better to be safe than sorry. So, with as much concentration as he could muster, he used the only ability he had been bored with, Earth War. He entombed himself within the large wall of Square. He made it about a carriage and a half away from him in all directions, as he didn't want to spook the Alpicas too much. It was one thing to be safe within the sudden wall in between you and a large predator. It was another to be completely enclosed with the feeling of being trapped. With that, he waited. Waited for the sound of pound or scratching, or even the earth moving beneath his very feet. If that was a plant-type monster, it wouldn't be all that impossible for it to use roots to trap prey. But there was nothing. Nothing, except a single voice saying, Hey, um, are you okay there? Marwell's eyes widened. The voice sounded off. Sure, it was able to speak common tongue fairly well, but he could detect the undercurrent of some other sounds. It was a skills effect, and not an actual language that someone had learned. The only thing that Marwell could think about was the mimicry. Some monsters were known to have that ability to lure the prey into a false sense of complacency. He wouldn't be fooled so easily. That was when a different voice rose above the din. Well, it would almost be a compliment to call it a voice. The sound it made was like branches of trees trying to find a harmony with the wind, while rubbing together quite aggressively. Two monsters, but I only saw one. Wait, what if... Marwell thought he couldn't exactly take down his wall to check. I know, plant, they're the first things that we've seen in ages that have been walking around. I should have known you might have scared them off. More creaking. Look, I get it, you're big, but it isn't like you can control what size you are. Some sharp snaps swallowed by a rustling. All right... Well, how are we supposed to talk to them anyhow? It isn't like they even said anything. At this, Marwell remembered an application he found for Earth Wall a while back. Reversing it gave Earth Pit, while diminishing the power he gave it, and allowing him to adjust the height and depth. He wasn't too sure if it worked sideways, but he was quite willing to try it. If nothing happened, he'd assume that it was just two monsters and try to make a tunnel underground for his alpacas, so if something did happen, however, well, there would be an interesting story there. He brought his focus into the effort of doing something so delicate, and then he released his concentration with a sigh. He'd done it. He had written when there was no paper. He had done something new with his ability, something that made all of his previous purchases of paper appear to be less than necessary. 
Who are you, friend or foe? What in the place of internal damnation? Wait, could it? Uh, me and Blan are friends. He's a good boy. But we're sorry we scared you too bad. Ah, Marwell sighed relief. It was just an expert tamer. And your merciful gods, his heart wouldn't stop pounding. He feared that he was a monster and he could just climb over the wall. It wasn't like he could make a ceiling over his enclosure. He changed the words. Yeah, don't worry, he's perfectly tamed. A slight rustle. I know, I know, you're a wild animal. You can't be contained. Look, it's fine. This is the first God's damn person that I've ever met in forever that wasn't actively trying to take over my mind. I mean, like he could at least help us. All right? A slight shift in lettering. No right, we'll make sure to stay still. I understand that you might be a bit frightened of his appearance, though. So I would suggest maybe, um, not screaming at him. His ego is very fragile. A sharp snap. I just thought you might appreciate it if he wasn't bad-mouthing you in the future, okay? I'm not trying to imply anything here. A brief rustle occurs before dying down to nothing. So, um, are you going to pull down your walls or are we going to sit out here without seeing you? Marwell prepared himself before releasing the walls. They fell back down to earth with only a slight outline regarding where they were pulled up from the ground. Light vaulted back into the space properly and he was slightly blinded due to his enhanced vision before he saw what was made the alpacas tremble in fear. It was a wolf. Sure, it was made of moss, leaves, ivy, and wood, but it was still a wolf all the same. It was also a fair bit bigger than the average wolf. It was only slightly less tall than the alpacas, and before he could bring up his walls again, he noticed the thing sitting on top of it. He didn't really know what to make of it. It wasn't a cobalt, essop, orc, or even a bass like him. Sure, it had the same traits as a lot of them, preferably taking after the essop, but its body was built slightly different. Its legs were far thicker than any eaves, and it had no fur on its visible body, like a bast's. It did not even have a tail like a cobalt, and even its nose wasn't like an orc's. An undiscovered tribe, maybe. It would certainly make sense, judging that the only things on its being were plant coverings and the leafy satchel dangling off its shoulder. Oh my god, you're wearing clothes. It's been so long since I've had any proper ones. And look at you, you're so short and it's adorable. You're almost like a cat I used to have. There was a brief rustle from the wolf before Marwal inwardly sighed. He motioned him to come closer. He guessed he couldn't fault it for gushing over him like that. If he hadn't seen one of his type before, he doubt he'd seen his either. Well, this was almost a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence for him, he supposed. He dreaded having to deal with this, uh, man, it appeared. Tourists were always the hardest to deal with in his experience as a merchant. End of story. Chapter 22 So, um... You can't talk. The cat person shakes his head yes. All the while, he's just staring at Kojo. Is he, um, rare or something? Look, I understand Kojo's a little big, but he, he can't help that. It's just who he is. Kojo's eyes open up, and he gives me a nod before closing them back up and falling asleep. Or at least, I assume so. It's difficult to say if plants actually sleep or not. The little guy shakes his head before frowning a little bit. I feel the ground shake under me as words are once again spelled out. It's not that. Well, maybe it's partially that. I was just wondering how you keep him around. You say that you haven't tamed him, and yet I cannot think of an animal that stuck around any specific person for this long, unless you, you raised it. I turn my head away from the ground to stare across the campfire at the person. Well, it turns out that since I saved his life, he feels like he has some sort of life debt thing that he's got to pay back. I personally don't understand it all that well, but I've accepted it. The cat nods before once again gesturing to the ground next to me. I won't ask him about it in accordance. If you're willing to tell me, I bet it'd be quite the story. I look back up to find his eyes shining. Accordance with what, exactly? What do you mean? In accordance with what? Is there some sort of a law of the road? At this, 
I can noticeably tell that his fur bristles. His head tilts up towards the evening sky as he sighs somewhat raspily. The ground shudders. Then either I'm your first contact outside of your tribe, or other people have been quite distasteful towards you. Huh. Well, you're the first person I've met since I escaped the Kaldara. There doesn't seem to be any noticeable change in him other than the slow tilt of his head downward. He meets my eyes as I can feel the shiver in the earth. Are you a monster? Monster, huh? Guess that might be what they call the weird animals in there. You don't have to worry about that. I was not born there, simply brought. At this, his posture relaxes before his bushy eyebrows tilt in confusion. You were brought there? Yeah, I was sleeping in my bed after a bad night out drinking. Next thing I know, I wake up in a cave with growls in the distance and wearing nothing. It seems to me like you were part of an elaborate prank to be. Some life friends tend to do that. <sighs> Most of my friends have all left me a while back. Those who didn't mostly kept to themselves. Hmm, <clears throat> quite the conundrum. If I had any suspicions, I'd say it was the work of the gods. Gods, huh? So appearing out of nowhere isn't uncommon enough that the merchant knows tales of it. Seems to me like asking him questions might be my only way to get somewhat true answers around here. Well, if it's the work of the gods, better get some answers to that. Do you know where a temple or a church might be around here? The cat person points back the way I came. Around three to four days travel that way to get to the nearest city. Might be a village or two along the path, but otherwise nothing else. I could accompany you if you like. My suspicion rises to meet the occasion. Why would you do that? Call it a moral obligation or simply tradition. Stranger and stranger. Wait, I can ask all my questions. No, stop. Work your way to that. It's not like you're going anywhere. So, um, you're a merchant, correct? The cat nods. Would you happen to sell any clothes? The eyebrows furrow as he stands to his feet and walks over to the cart. I wonder. Analyze. Name Marwell Craigane. Race Vast. Class Merchant Level 45. Titles Mute. Man of Character Forlorn Forsaken. Level 55. HP 4,675, NP 756, AP 10,000. Holy crap, why does he have so much HP and AP? Damn, I'm a long way from even reaching the standards of a normal person, aren't I? Ugh, crap, this is bad. If I get into a fight with him, I'm done for, even if he's a lower leveled. It's a good thing I figured out that he was a guy though, otherwise that would have been awkward to ask. I hear a rustling from his cart. I look over to find the armadillo cow who has awoken by the noise, but he just puts his head back down and munches on the grass. Then the cat. Wait, I know his name now. Marwal emerged. His return almost seemed holy in a way. Maybe it was the lack of decent communication. Maybe it was just me being away from civilization. But seeing those clothes that he brought out almost made me believe that there were gods again. I was brought out of his musings when I felt the tapping on my foot. I looked down. I got an extra set of pants, a shirt, and a satchel. Must be better than leaves. Uh. Believe me, you have no idea. I'm just lucky I didn't make anything containing plants like poison ivy. Thank you, just... Uh, thanks. How much? No, I shouldn't accept anything of the sort from you, especially since you... The ground shimmies a bit before new words appear. How do you have money if you lost everything? Uh, wait a minute. I think I, uh... No, I have a way out of this. I got it from the voice of the gods when I escaped the Kaldara. He noticeably think about it for a second before nodding. He walks over to me and hands me the cards. Wait, there's no underwear... Crap. Better than nothing, I suppose. But it's gonna chafe like hell. As I put on the clothes, I find that the pants are a tad tighter than I'd like. And I'm pulled out of my musings by a... You know what? I'm kind of tired trying to make dirt writing interesting, even if it's by magic. So, where are you from? Don't think I've ever seen your kind around here. Huh. Should I... Nah. 
Definitely not. If what I'm thinking is happening is happening, then uh, no. Don't particularly know, or too well. I was part of a small tribe that interacted with, um, think, stupid. What's the typical fantasy race? Dwarves? Seriously. Seriously, you picked dwarves. Why? Why am I stuck inside your brain? Can't say I've heard of that race. But then again, I've never seen yours before either. He is noticeably staring at Kojo. So how did he evolve? Evolve? I think he ate a weird plant or something in the Kildara. Or maybe it was my magic. I don't know. At this, his eyes stare sharply into mine. The ground feels wriggling insects with now how much dirt is being overturned. You are a magician. Who taught you? Uh, I'm self-taught. Dang! You must either be the most courageous or the most stupid person in the world. What? Why? At this, the voice cuts through with a croaky laugh. Well, I guess that means the latter. Were there no magic users in your town? No, we mostly dealt with the physical side of things. Ah, reinforcement then, same as me. Well, uh, let's just say if you did magic wrong, you wouldn't be here at all. Reinforcement? What is that? Wait, would I be dead if I did something wrong? What? What do you mean, dead? Most magic users do one thing before they're even able to use magic. That would be breaking the Mind Sphere. Any wrong move and doing so would have lead to brain-dead husks set to explode at the slightest provocation. So that sphere wasn't my soul. Like my head! Dear Lord, why am I always so close to death? Now I don't even want to use magic. But at least it kind of explains why dual thinking works like it does. Probably just a self-preservation instinct that got put inside that, uh, mind sphere. Is that the technical term, or is it my translation just not too good? Well, it's a good thing I'm not dead yet, right? He laughs again before pulling out some raw meat out of his pack and cooking it over the flame. I'd say so. What magic do you use, by the way? I assume plot-type ones, yeah. No, it, it was healing. He freezes. Where his posture before was loose and he was always slightly moving, now his posture is rigid. He doesn't even seem to notice that his little piece of meat falls into the fire. I hear his labored breathing, almost like panting, as his method of communication was set up once more. Are you... Uh, are you a priest? No, not really. Just got an aspect for it. I see. He pauses the curse in the conversation as crickets click in the distance. So I assume that is not your true form. Oh, oh yeah. Aspects change your body, right? I mean, besides coming a bit paler than normal, I'm kind of about the same. His eyes seem to furrow as he stares into the fire and sighs. You sad about the meat? Yes, I usually keep it in storage until I meet someone on the road. Best to share a nice meal between others, right? Yeah, I get you. So if you're a merchant, what kinds of things do you sell? But that said, the merchant got up and tore through his papers while the crowd rumbled like an earthquake. Dear Lord, what did I just unleash? End of chapter. Chapter 23 There was an order to things. That was how Grodai usually liked it. He was a simple man that liked simple things. For example, every other day he would go to the market, sell his produce, and buy from the baker's daughter. Further into the night, he would then go back home, pray for a good harvest, and go to sleep early after making sure his cattle were safe. It was a simple pattern that he often repeated, only broken up by the village head on various occasions. There would be a monster sighting, and all of them would have to pull their money to post for a hunter, or perhaps a festival was coming up and they needed his help with decorations. Other than that, Grodrai kept to his schedule. And he was happy. Today, that had changed. Rather, instead of going and doing field work once again, he was caught outside his house staring down the road at something which caught him off guard. There was a carriage coming to town. Normally, this isn't too distracting for him. He'd usually walk over, say hi to the carriage driven, help with the directions, or tell them where he might be able to stay for the night for cheap. 
he did live on the outskirts for a reason, after all. Now, what caught him off guard was the thing beside it. That, without a doubt, had to be a monster. What confused Gordry, though, was the fact that this was calmly walking next to the carriage. Now, Gordry wasn't exactly sure why this would be something that occurred in the real world. He had, of course, heard about tamers before, but he hadn't ever thought that he could tame something that big. Plus, the class details weren't exactly known to him at all that well. The local lawkeeper would probably know about it better. But he hadn't talked to her for forever. Plus, he doubted he could get to her in time before it arrived. So, he put on a brave face and walked over. If he couldn't get the news out, he might as well stall for time. At least long enough for other people to notice. So, with determined steps, he abandoned his fields and walked closer. It wasn't until he was able to make out the detail of who was riding the carriage did he realize that he had nothing to fear. Sure, the monster was looking at him, more like staring, really. But he was witnessing an old acquaintance coming to town. He also remembered that he was about to bear witness to a flash much closer than what he was normally used to. So he closed his eyes in preparation. Something bright flashed through his eyes, along with the sound of thunder. He opened them again to see the familiar message. Marwell the Merchant Marwell, I didn't know you were coming around. Glad to see you're so soon, but uh, did you not sell a lot in the city? At this, there was some fuss as the driver's seat as Marwell reined in his alpacas. Meanwhile, the beast beside the carriage had fallen on its face in a dazed state before picking itself up again and glaring at the carriage. It growled a bit before focusing its eyes back on the road. Marwell, what's going on out there? I was taking a nap. Already in the city. At this, Rodry saw a thing pump out of the carriage blinds. Ah, oh, hello there. I take it the big one over there is yours. He glanced over at the aforementioned green beast before looking back at the Ev. Wait, are you an Ev? Grodry looked askance before raising himself in pride. Why, I do believe I am a good sir. Why do you ask? The thing looked conflicted before giving a response. Not seen too many eaves in my time alive. Only heard about you through others, you see. And to answer your question earlier, yes, that is my friend. And no, he won't eat you. He is thoroughly a plant, so he just needs water and sun. At this, Grodry was seen visibly relaxing, before he noticed that Marble had pulled out his chalkboard. Sorry for turning on that little marvel while you were right in front of me. I guess I was only paying attention to the village. You're not injured, are you? Not too much, to be honest. Some spots float in their own, but uh, other than that, not much. Marwell's smile returned to his face. Good, by the way, this is my companion, Dave. We met on the road and I've agreed to shepherd him across to the next city. Grodry struck his hand upwards towards the thing looming over the seat. Pleasure to meet you then, Dove. Dave sat down next to Marwell and reached a hand back down before giving a handshake. He was well. I tell you, there hasn't been many people I've met who are willing to handshake now and again. Don't mention it. Little hospitality tends to go a long ways. Anyways, how many marbles you got this time, Marwell? The little bast thought, checked under his seat, pulled out his written documents, and started counting. Dave leaned over and took a look at the paper as well. Seems to me it's just a bunch of... Uh... At this, Marwell stuck a hand into Dave's mouth, before showing his response on his board and sternly glaring at the occupant. It seems to me like Marvels, Mystical Marvels, and Mercantile can go open for business for about a week before heading off. Gordry nodded. Seems about right. Although, given you have a passenger, I say you probably wouldn't spend less time here. Marwell nodded. Well, all right then. I'll go tell the village head then. Make sure no one's a screaming a monster, you know. At this, Marwell nodded, pulled his hand out of Dave's mouth and waved goodbye. Why the place in internal damnation did you do that for, Marwell? I was just going to... However, Lord Dry could no longer hear the conversation, or at least the one-sided bits. He had already ran too far away to hear it. He was excited, of course, 
Marwal had been given the stout his wares at a steep reduction in pricing. Unlike most merchants who would only go down if someone held bargaining, he was already aware of the wealth disparity with those who lived in different places. There was also the fact that he sold the Grodry a nice machine early and last summer. That put him in Grodry's good graces once winter came around. Of course, some of his wares did have errors, but since Marwal was still there when he sold them, he was able to help with the repairs and tell the others the proper maintenance of the tools. Yep, Grodry thought that this was going to be another good day. It may have started off strange, but at least it could start and any day that he was still alive was a good one in his mind. End of chapter. Chapter 24 So, uh, you do this every time you come to town. I look around myself in wonder. I haven't been in a farmer's market in a while, after all. Plus, all the various people here are kind of cool to look at. Some of them are a little beast guys, like my merchant friend. Some orcs, like I saw before. And still, there was more... That being the elves. Now, I expected elves to be more human-like, or something. But I guess it makes some sense that if they were the same as me, some people wouldn't have balked at my appearance. Most of the elves I've seen are kind of like what you'd expect elves to be. Except that they're kind of made up of, uh... I guess the appropriate term would be various elements. Some are made up of pebbles, while others are made up of plants. I asked Marwall about it earlier. And he just said that most elves start off like me, nothing on them except a little bit of hair. As they grow older, certain affinities express themselves and things with the affinity are attracted to them. The expressed affinity seems to come from factors of their environment which increase the chances of forming an affinity with materials common to that environment. As the elf grows older, the bare bits get covered and eventually replaced with the material until they look like what I see here. He even told me about some elves he met that were made up of sand and wind, which I find intensely fascinating. I mean, I already know that the affinities can change a person's natural form, but it seems amazing that an entire species naturally develops like that without any outside interference. Just thinking about the complexity and unlikeliness of the situation leads my head to wander into strange thoughts. However, I mentally give myself a shake and turn my attention back to the conversation which I had started with Marwal. He flipped his little chalk tablet towards me. For some of the towns, yes. Most often or not, I save that specific light scroll for the towns that are like me rather than the cities I visit. They don't often let me make a big splash inside the city walls, it said. I nodded towards him and turned back towards the counter. There wasn't much in the line in front, but I think I might have been because Kojo was sleeping beside the carriage. Or at least, I think it was. Can't really tell when he does anyway. Why did you want me to man the shop anyway? Scribbling fills the air and stops before he turns to slap towards me. You are the only one that can actually talk to the others in this group. I'd much rather you be able to read on what's on the list I gave you and answer people who ask what we have out loud. Huh. Makes sense, I guess. Do I get paid for this? A little raspy laugh escapes his throat before he shakes his head and pulls out another slate. He rewrote something for this. Only if we sell something. Huh, well, I guess I gotta give it my all if I wanna get paid. But, even if I'm in another world, it's still rather weird that I'm just doing a 9-to-5 for my first job. Figured I could do adventuring stuff. We all gotta start somewhere, though. Wait... Did we ever talk about why we aren't going faster? If I can go home, I can probably should get to the church or something. So, um, is there a reason we aren't heading to the city as fast as we can? He lifts his little hat off his face and stares at me. He doesn't move for a second before getting a somewhat big slate to write on. Chalk scratching fills the air as he writes a few words and turns it towards me. Your village wasn't very religious, were they? Is this something I should know about? Cautiously, I shake my head and he scribbles some more. There are some guards who only show up in their churches at specific times. For this particular city, it's a church's goddess doesn't show up until around late at night on Seller's Day. That's weird. That word isn't translating right. Is it the name for the day that doesn't translate correctly, or are there more than seven days per week? 
Ari, um, I couldn't get that last word. I may know the language, but my reading skills are kind of bad. He looks at me puzzled before he writes more words down. The day where the sun is the closest to us. I'm sorry, closest. Does the sun move? <sighs> well, I know it moves a lot back in my world, but it's not so noticeable that you can see it from the ground. How does seasons work then? Yes, I might just have to go for the throat then. How many days are there in a week for you? I'm used to a calendar with seven. His eyes gain a bit of clarity before he scribbles some more. Ah, that explains it. You are on the inferior moon's calendar. Makes sense. You should probably get a bit of new knowledge then. There are nine days per week, ten weeks per season. That help? Ah, that's, um, that's a bit weird. Then again, different world, different time. Probably. No, yes, wait, yeah. There'd be a different age here. Crap. I'm gonna have to get a paper for this. Thanks, um, I'll have to ask the day's names later then. Don't see why you can't ask now. Not like there's many customers around. He swipes away the previous writings and proceeds to scribble a lot more on the bigger slate before turning it towards me. First is Mer Day, the day where the three moons are the closest. Then there's Glen Day, the day where the most churches go to recruit potential priests. After that is Glau Day, when most children of age receive their first classes. Then Harper's Day happens. It's when most open-air markets open, which happens to be today. Papra Day, I forgot what happens then. Trail Day, which is the start for the rest of most of the working class. Jo Day, which I can't recall off the top of my head either. Then there's Trust Day, which is the final day of rest for the working class. Finally, there's Sellers Day, when some churches restrict access to their respective gods, which is when we'll arrive and when we leave tomorrow. Are the moons called something different here? It translated funky again. It'd be a bit weird to ask about the moons are called, though. Feel like it could be common knowledge. Also, kind of cool that there's all this fantasy stuff in my face. It's a shame, though, that some of these days are more than two syllables. Really makes it weird just saying these days in a row. Should I ask about history? No. Probably wouldn't know anyway. I mean, I don't even know how our days got named, except that it's from the Romans or something. Thanks for the info. He nods towards me before leaning back at his makeshift pile of clothes and putting his hat back on his face. Yes, he's going back to sleep. With a sigh, I pull my attention from the indoor part of the carriage back to the outside. There wasn't really much to attend to, though. Most people seemed to avoid the carriage like a carried a plague. More often than not, they would visit other produce venues. Gotta be honest, though, even if it was boring standing there waiting for customers, it was kind of interesting just people watching. Even now and then, I'd see something strange, like a striped tail, or perhaps something tangible that I could get, like that purple spiked vegetable I can see being exchanged for, uh, copper. Wait, what is the money system here? I thought my gold coins would have been the basic cash since it was given to me by the system, but it's not like that. Am I actually a rich vagrant? Probably won't know until I buy something, and even then. I don't think I'll get a chance if I'm manning this counter. Plus, if it is weird to get gold from the system, then I think something might be weird for me in general in regards to it. But I'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. Eventually. Excuse me, mister. I look around, snapped out of my wanderings to find an elven child below me, barefoot and on grass and gravel. Yes? Do you have anything that stops nightmares? I heard from Tim that he got something from here a while ago, and he forgot the scary dreams. Oh, jeez, kid. Not a question. Hang on a second, Huddy. Uh, let me check our stock. I pull out the tablet that Marwal pre-wrote for me, for our inventory. However, I'm interrupted from my musings from Marwal tapping on my back. I turn around to find that he's already handed me something, and already shoved a tablet in my face. Mind chaser, four silver, activated by tapping it to your head before going to bed. I can't tell if that's a good price or not for a kid. I take it from him, slide the curtains on the carriage behind me, and turn back towards the kid. There you go, honey, that'll be four silver. She looks a little surprised before she reaches through her tunic to pull out a pouch wrapped around her neck. 
Opening it, I can see a lot of bronze coins, but not a lot of silver. She shakenly hands me three silver and ten copper. I guess the exchange rate for certain money types operates on a ten system as well. Somehow. Thanks, mister. Now how about leaking through my thoughts? What? Before I can ask any questions, she has already walked back into the crowd on the bustle on some feet away. The only trace I can get now is a slight giggling as she heads away. What? What did you mean by hell leaking? Marwell, what did you mean? He doesn't answer. Marwell! He sits up surprised before falling off his sack. He fumes a little before getting up and writing very angrily on a nearby slate. What? I already gave you the thing. What else is there? Why did that child say that hell was in her dreams? At this, his look becomes pensive. He stares at me for a while before erasing what he has on his slate and representing it to me with a new dialogue. Oh, that poor girl. Seems she's of age. What does puberty have to do with this? Puzzle, he writes some more. Sorry, I forgot your kind doesn't have much contact with the gods. Young minds of certain age in a place near a realm of influence are prone to certain impressions from that realm. Impressions of that god's personal dominion. That, that, that isn't right. No, that is why we have these devices, after all. Depending on the nightmare or dream, the child could choose to follow where they want to go. While I read his new writing, I can tell he isn't studying my face for social cues. He's more, uh, staring at the sky. Did you have one, too? At this, he winces slightly before relaxing a bit. New writing takes place of the old. Yes, I was drowning in a desert. Drowning? How? It's a dream. Normally you wake up when pain happens. How? Sand whirled around like the sea and rushed down my throat while I tried to push myself above it. I could sometimes see the skeletons grasping for the open sky before consumed by the sand as well, never to be heard from again until the tides relinquish. And even then, their bones would be ground down until finally they would become the sand that sweeps more under its thrall. Near the end, I could begin to feel my flesh give way to fresh bone. That's, uh, that's goddamn scary for a kid. I mean, I didn't have nightmares like that before, but I did have one about everyone but me being made up of bees, and that scared the crap out of me. How old were you? He snaps out of whatever vision he had, before erasing the large tablet he brought out and bringing it up to my vision a smaller one, with only a couple notches. Six, but that was because I grew up in a heavily religious city. There were churches almost everywhere, and none were more vocal than the agricultural ones. After all, the city was maintained by a multitude of farms, so most people got scared of not doing their daily tasks to maintain the god's local influence in the region. That's still messed up, man. Why can't you just hand one of these things to everyone? Why do you have to make them pay? You don't think that I already offer them a discount? This is a particularly poor town, Dave. At the price I was giving it, it's costing me money to even buy it in the first place. I would love for there to be one available for everyone if there could be, but not many people can make these magical items cheaply. I sit in silence on the little stool, registering Marwell's note. I turn away from him, nodding, staring back at the village. Only now do I notice how run down everything is. The shingles are falling off the roof. The people aren't wearing much in the way of clothes, albeit some of them probably don't have a choice because of their bodies. Looking at the state of it all, I think I'm beginning to feel the weight of all of it sinking in. The groaning of the carriage under the movement of Mawa, the voices outside speaking in different language that I can understand even if I don't know it, the slight haze of green that I can see to the immediate left of me. And the ever-present bars at the bottom of my vision. Oh. Oh, God. This. This is too much. Why is this too much? I can handle getting animals and things because the situation called for it. I could even accept something like the system that I was forced to have. I could even explain understanding Kojo because I thought maybe I had developed something of a Wilson in a volleyball. I can even explain that I'm understanding this language because, uh, why can I explain understanding this language? 
isn't understanding the language a really bad thing? Like gods can see in my head and read all my thoughts. Why? Why are my thoughts so hazy? Where was I? Oh yeah, got a man the counter, just like when I worked in fast food. Shouldn't be too big of a problem. After today though, we're finally going to go to the church. I can finally see if gods are real or not. And if they are, why the heck was I taken from my home like that? I can't keep the smile off my face either. I'm so excited. I'm kind of bored though. Even with people watching, I still haven't had a single person walk up and buy something. Must be something that Kojo's doing. Ah oh well. End of chapter. Chapter 25 The night sky glittered as the blue moon was eclipsed by stars. Sounds in the biped village were almost non-existent as he breathed in the night air. Of course, he wasn't exactly alone in doing so. The beast of bird next to him did so as well. So, why not leave? Well, thing of your size, I assume there would be better things to do than stick around. He turned his head towards the origin of the horse voice. The large besheld. He was, of course, slightly upset that it wasn't still scared of him. Seeing him nearly wet itself in terror brought back some feelings of superiority for a while. But after a couple minutes alone with it, it was the most questioning thing that he'd ever spoken to. Besides friend, of course. It was a promise. One cannot often discount their own words too often. Otherwise, how else can one uphold their honor and their own self-image? His reply made the beast chuckle as it turned away from him to stare at the gentle flickering of the lanterns, their blue glow seeming to calm him. Over the trotted path, there seemed to be light bugs splitting about, landing on some of the wooden supports of the buildings. A promise like that isn't too often attainable. Sooner or later, you have to leave him. The beast's voice sounded melancholic as it looked towards the end of the road and gazed off to far-off plains before turning his attention back towards the sink beside him, to speak words that he was sure that it needed to hear. You do not belong here. I know that. Believe you me. I can still feel their stares even when I pretend to be asleep. The plant sighed like a creaking tree, as something seemed to tease at the edges of his thought, some forgotten feeling from long ago. He couldn't quite put a name to it, which was odd considering becoming who he was now made his mind seem a bit clearer. It seems to me like you're trying to keep a hold of yourself from what you've said before. He was the only thing to stay constant between you before and now. What the Bashald had said seemed to ring somewhat true to him. His friend was the only one that could tell whether or not he changed in between his evolution. He did not know if his mannerisms had gotten rid of, or he simply developed new ones. For something to stand within him through it all, it would have been fairly easy for his friend to know whether or not he was changing more than he did himself. You could pray to Onda. Since you've done so much, he might have taken notice of you. At this, the plot balked. How do you know of him? How do you know of his overbearing pressure? His questions made the beast chuckle a bit before shaking a little. You think that only your kind know him? Even if you are most similar to his form, others still remember his past tales of him. He is father of beasts, after all. If his children forgot he existed, we make for unfilial family. The horns twisted in the light as the beast poked the lantern nearest him, as he glanced behind him as the yoke, sighing gently. Even I am no longer a proper beast. I still pray to him. I have done so in the wee hours of the night, and I still do so in the middle of the day. No matter where I am, I hold his image in my mind and pray for continued goodwill. The beast rolled his neck under his shell before turning his head to look back towards the newfound conversation partner. Even if you are no longer a proper beast, at this, the plant stood up. Silence! He stopped. He glanced around and swiveled his ears. Nothing seemed to stir. He returned his head back towards the beast and spoke, 
while keeping his voice at harsh whisper. I am still more beast than you. You've been tamed, chained, and broken. I can leave any time I want and still uphold the tenants of the wild, even if my form is no longer flesh. He stared down at his paw and looked at it. He could feel the pulsing of life through his veins as he moved from some of the tendrils to making up his leg. He shivered before getting drawn out by the beast's snarl. And there it is, the realization, the dawning of the fact that you are no longer made in father's image. That is why I tell you to pray. I know this will nag at you for a time. Being how I am now as well, if I can still hear father though, I don't see why you can't. The bishop, black eyes gleamed in the light as he squinted on the sides of his head. His words seemed to stem from a place of hope, but its gaze felt malicious to the plant. Then he thought of something. You want me to fail, don't you? It shrunk before laying down, grass being mushed against its side. I will not lie, yes, I do, for my instincts as prey remain strong. I still want to see predators writhe in frustration and not getting what they want. Even if I wish you the best, some small part will still find satisfaction or sadness at what is to come. It tried rolling over before it got stopped by the yoke. Sighing, it resolved itself to lay on its side, idly scratching at the nooks and crannies within its shell like armor. Kojo was silent for a time before responding to him. Very well, I guess there is no other option but to bray. So Plant began doing what he hadn't since he was a pup. He laid down, raised his head to the sky, and sang. You have initiated the Song of Prayer. Two valid deities detected. Deity one, Onda. Deity two, Groud. Which deity would you like to contact? Onda stirred from his nap. Something seemed to be happening. He wasn't all too sure what it was until he recognized the screen in front of him. He sighed as he stretched his back in the moss that he sat upon. He silenced the birdsong within his domain as he walked. While on his way to his destination, he straightened out of his fur and flexed his claws. The joints were a bit stiff and sore, but only because he liked the feeling of waking up as a mortal. He started towards his pacing stream. More often than not, that was where he did most concerning the work that he'd been forced to partake in. He would walk along the shoreline and send false messages of progress towards Barank, or basically anything that had to do with the system that was set up. Except this, of course. It was a bit more important. Thus, it was kind of necessary to go towards his seat of power. His lazing rock. He walked upwards through the somewhat grassy knoll of his creation to the rock overlooking his prayer circle. He laid himself down upon it and checked who was actually contacting him through the prayer network. Somewhat surprised, he relaxed his stance for a bit. For him, the usual prayer was made of his younger children who would not understand the order of the world around them. Of course, when it was the cases, he'd tell them not to waste their prayers, as they were only allowed four others for their entire lives. Sometimes, it was his priestly division, if you could call them that. Most of his priests were usually devout hunters or followers of the tenants, and they only called on him whether or not something was against him at that moment. Then, there were these kinds of calls. He answered the call, and the prayer circle activated below him. The runes powered up slowly before the light from them formed and became one of his own, one that he particularly had an eye on for a while since its evolution. So you appear before me. Is there something you need, my child? At this, the vision looks upward to meet his eyes. I am still your child. At this, under balked. Of course, even if you have changed, it is no fault of your own. If you've been born as a beast, then you're always gonna be my child. No matter what form or what circumstances you find yourself in. The tenseness in the vision's haunches loosened as it fell to the floor. 
Thank you. I just... I... I wasn't sure. Honda barked in laughter and gazed downwards. <laughs> I don't see why you should be. Out of all my children, you've upheld the tenets of strength and of the wild the most, even if you aren't among them right now. At this, the vision looked back upwards, tilting its head. You know where I am? Honda nodded. Why wouldn't I know where all my children are? Plus, uh, the company you keep is quite interesting. The vision's face twitched a little bit before steadying its sudden shaky breath. You know about him. Honda debated on what exactly he could tell him before opening his mouth to speak. Oh, of course, before he even arrived in your previous home, he was a subject to a most uh, interesting event that some guards are still puzzled by. This vision trembled a bit. Is, uh, is he going to be okay? Honda's gaze turned gentle. You uh, really care about him, don't you? The vision was startled a little, and his tone of voice before nodding vigorously. Yes, we are blood brothers. It is only natural. Onda made no visible movement before his eyes seemed to gain a bit of a glint. Ah, you plan on following him until he or you dies, aren't you? The vision nodded once. Almost resolutely. I cannot lie. Yes. Onda sighed as he pulled up his screen. On it, the basic information of the individual before him. An unspoken question rang through the god's mind. One best kept for later. There was a better one that actually helped his future prospects. If you plan on following him, no matter where it takes you, you might end up in places I cannot reach and places where you are at a significant disadvantage. You know that, don't you? The vision began to nod absentmindedly, before halting. Its gaze wandered down as it thought, before bringing up its head and speaking. Yes, I know. I, uh, I do not ask for much, simply for you to watch over me. And if anything were to occur, I understand. I will make sure that your story will be told. The vision nodded before beginning to fade out of existence. However, it quickly was brought back to visibility and looked very confused. You know, I could let you leave now, but there is something I need to give you first. At this, the vision balked. There was usually only one reason that someone would be kept past their original prayer's goals, and that would be a blessing. A god's blessing was often hard to attain, even harder to keep, as most often than not, those blessings would fade if the god found anything poor within the filial ability. So, it was reasonable for the vision to bow low before it. No, I do not deserve such things. If I think you deserve them, then you do. What other authority would you say could better judge you? At this, the god stood up for the first time in the entire conversation, and began walking downwards off of his sitting rock through the air. As he got closer to the vision, it began to shake violently under the throes of emotion. It was only when a paw touched his back that it stopped. I name thee champion of the wilds and of beast. May you walk unhindered by peer and those of lowly station. My, my power flow through you along with my will as you walk the ground. May your claws find victory and your height go untarnished. As the ceremony played out, the vision began to get clearer and clearer within the glade, its form getting definition beyond what the light gave it. Now that you have been appointed the station, I hope that you can bring honor onto it, Plant nodded. By the way, there's been something bothering me about your name. Plant cocked his head. The skill makes everything a tad too literal for my taste. Your name wasn't meant to be literally Plant. It's exactly what it sounds like. Kojo. Kojo nodded. Before I bid you leave, there is something I need to do. A screen appeared in front of Kojo. 
This is the result of your new vocation. You can now understand the common tongue of bipeds, as well as read their language. This makes the voice much easier to understand, as well as more ingrated with you. Your abilities will be better understood, and I've also left you some new ones for you to figure out. He gestured towards the bottom of the list. I think you'll find this one particularly helpful when trying to join your friend inside places you can't go. Kojo stared at the last line a bit before grinning. Thank you for all you've done, my god. Wanda tilted his head. It was of no real consequence. Let it not be known that I do not help my children if I am able. He nodded his head downwards towards the runic circle. You should probably go soon. Doing this made you actually disappear from the world, and some might question where you are if you spend any more time here. Gojo nodded before he vanished, without a trace. Honda looked around the sun and glade before sighing. It wasn't often he held company, and it saddened him that he had to send them away so soon. Of course, in his mind he knew it had to be done. After all, as all things are with gods, this was calculated, albeit with the child's best interest in mind. If he wanted to pick a champion, there was no better to pick. This was a fusion that hadn't been seen in a while after all. It would be rather unfortunate if he hadn't been able to capitalize on it before Groud could. Plus, this let him get a fair bit closer to smelling where exactly the newcomer was. So far, he had gotten scents of grasses and flowers, and the slight scent of wood and the sea. There were a couple places like that that he knew of. Fewer still had cities nearby. Onda could only hope that he could find it faster than any other god here. The plan was at stake, after all. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.